Many people affectionately remember the spiritual magazine Namaste, created and edited by my friend and colleague, the spiritual teacher Hilda de la Rosa, all those years ago. Well, Hilda has finally written a book, an incredible book about relationships. It affected me very deeply. I had to speak to her about it. So, you've written this amazing book, Love uh, Versus Fear. And, uh, I mean, for me, even that title is so rich with questions and ideas and so on. But the book is so much more than even those three little words make it out. I mean, I read the book and at first, you know, I was thinking, what is this? It's kind of, it's a love story. But then, of course, being you, you know, in, in every line, there's a lot of wisdom. So I thought, you know, so it's a, it's a love story. It's a story of a relationship that you've had full of your wisdom. But as the story and as the book progressed, I realized that what I was holding in my hands was a manual on love and relationships. Quite frankly, I think the manual on love and relationships, because that's really what blew me away about the book. This book is compulsory for anyone who has a relationship. It doesn't matter what your spiritual beliefs are about, because that isn't what's relevant about what your story of this relationship is. So, How wonderful is that? Thank you so much for that. That um, is truly humbling. Thank you. Well, you know, I think why it's so powerful is that, on the one hand, written by someone who we know you've got a lifetime of knowledge and experience and guidance and study and so on, but m more, more than that, it arose out of an experience. It arose out of your heart. And it yeah. tells the story of a relationship that I think, I assume, is very different than any relationship you've ever had before and took you to places, challenged you in ways perhaps that you've never been challenged before. Sure, yes. You have no idea. Um, I, it took a long time for me to actually come out with this knowledge because it was so radical and I literally pitched it to a couple of guys and said, why don't you try this with me? Let's see if this works because looking back in my own history, all my relationships ended the same way and I look at all my friends and all their relationships ended the same way. So it was interesting and I kept going back thinking, well, what are we doing wrong? Mm. So clearly what we're doing, we're taking the same tacky yucky, nonsense, negative behavior patterns, and we're bringing them into our new relationships. And we're applying the same mistakes, literally, in a new environment with a new man or a new woman or a new whatever. Mm. And we're getting exactly the same results. I thought, what do we need to change? And, you know, we've been spiritual teachers for many years now, Ron. So, and, and most of the spiritual teaching is how for me, how for me to leave my human body and get a state of bliss. Yes. That's not working for me anymore. So what I want to do is bring that universal love into this body, into this life. And I thought, what is going to make my relationship change radically? And then I came up with a formula. So, so, so you, I mean, the polarity is fear. You call it love versus fear. It's almost like you're saying there are only two paths. Either you're loving or you're fearing. Is, yeah, is that absolutely. what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Because there's under love all the nice yummy words like compassion mm. and um, joy and fun and uh, helpfulness and kindness and generosity. And under fear comes hate and judgment and disapproval and teaser lips and all of the tacky, mean stuff that we're not so good at. And all of us have that eternal yin yang. In us, in, in us, all of us have a dark side and a light side. And for me, it's the ability to choose every moment of every day. I can just remind myself that I have a choice. There's love or there's fear. In this moment, what am I choosing? I choose love. But we're human, so we forget. Yeah. And then, then we lose it a little bit again, and we get mean, and we get nasty, and you go, oh, done it again. But I can choose love again. So it's not a... You can't annihilate the negative aspect of yourself. You can only become aware that it exists and choose again. So it's like I can consciously choose love. I'm not likely to consciously choose fear, but I can recognize that I unconsciously chose it and try and make a better Absolutely. choice. 
Absolutely. So then a question I want to ask. So you say, as we all know, that we have these relationships that kind of all end the same way. I mean, sometimes it's like with the same guy or the same girl, his name and face have just changed. But are you suggesting perhaps that the reason why we end up in the same trouble again is because of fear? Categorically because of fear. Not only fear. What we do from the time we're very small, in the first time we recognize disapproval from parents, we begin to look around and think, what are the parents approving of? And we begin to mold our character to do that which they approve of. And in the process, we put a lid on a little bit of who we are. And the older we get, the more we hide ourselves and the more we turn ourselves into a pretzel to go and be something we're not. So we, we turn into, you know, when I first went on the spiritual path, I thought I have to be this sweet and nice person. Love, love and light. Love and light. Sweet and light. But it's not my personality, and I could never. It took me a long time to make peace with Gauchy Hilda and full of crap Hilda and don't mess with me Hilda and bring the wisdom, still kick ass wisdom to the party without feeling guilty that I should be sweeter and I should be nicer. But I'm not sweet. My personality is not sweet. My personality, you either hate me or you love me. There's no in between space. And for me, what I, what I learned to do as a, as a young woman is I'm very, very quick with my mouth. So if anybody challenged me, I would annihilate them and cut them off at the knees. And that was my best persona, which just is a protective mechanism which I present to the world if I'm feeling insecure. Mm. And insecure, I'm choosing fear. If I was not insecure and if I was confident and if I was loving myself, then I would end up being the positive aspect of my personality and I wouldn't need to annihilate anyone and cut them off at the knees or make them feel small. So then if we then land up in the same trouble and we keep because we're choosing fear, do you is it true that uh, we choose types and that's part of the problem? I think we choose the opposite of our wounding. Hmm. That's what I think we do. I think if 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 I was made me feel small as a child. I will pick a partner that will boost my ego and boost my consciousness. And the very thing that he, um, that he gives to me is the thing that I begin to fight. But I think his faults attract my faults. Mm. And that's why we end up in the same space all the time. Because our reactions don't change. Oh. Our reactions stay the same. For instance, if somebody had to say to me, it's seven o'clock. Why is dinner not ready? And I want to just go, who do you think you are to demand dinner on the table? What is wrong with you? Now when I enter into a relationship and somebody says, why isn't dinner on the table? And I go, you know, I've had a really hard day. I just don't feel like cooking. How about we go out? So it's a contextual thing that, yes. that if we change the behavior pattern, because my first reaction will always cause con confrontation. That the way I choose to behave consciously will eliminate confrontation and offer an alternative. Perhaps part of the reason why we consistently respond in the same negative way is because despite the negative vibe that that all is, we feel in control because it's a known situation and I feel that I can stop him reacting in XYZ way if I do this. And if I get in first with the hurt. <laughs> well, yes. That's the thing. You see, so whoever, whoever growls and, and snarls first is obviously the leader in this particular situation. And then he or she who has the last word is the ultimate winner. But then we have moments or days or weeks of a still staper, which doesn't serve the relationship. So we have the same crap that we bring again and again and again. And we're astonished that we have the same result. So who do you have to be? in order to attract that love into your life that we all seek and desire and yearn for. I think that's what the book conveys so well, that in the story of your relationship with Roy, you know, it's constantly pushing you to respond differently because like many relationships and certainly like many mature relationships, it's not our first relationship from, you know, 20 something, you know, we've got our patterns and our habits and our beliefs and expectations and you you know, it was a difficult, complicated relationship, especially in the beginning, the circumstances. 
and it pushed you and challenged you to have to respond differently and that Absolutely. kind of broke you open to get yeah. the lesson but yeah. in the end you know so much of the lesson is about unconditional love for me, it was a, the most vulnerable making thing I've ever done, Raj, because what this kind of intimacy requires is that I literally rip open all those hurt places in my heart, all of the, the pain and the fear and all of my natural inclination to hide and defend and, and go to Roy and say, I trust you implicitly that you will not hurt but I could only do that once I coaxed him out of his hurt pattern. So when he behaved in a snappy or hurtful manner, I used to touch his face and say, I love you, even if you're angry. And that's hard to do, where my reaction initially would be, what the hell are you angry about again? So yeah. if I change my approach, the reaction changes. So initially when I say to him, I love you, even if you're angry, he would Quite not, he, he couldn't compute that because he'd never received that. And when he received that consistently, he found he became, he, he became safe to feel right. angry or hurt. So it's to create the, the safety that no matter what he or she is doing, you can hold the space for them to be that and still love them beyond that. If you know what I mean. Absolutely, because what's so powerful, and I think for people to realize in that, is that, you know, if you're doing work on how you love and relationship and so on, you might despair and think, what's the point if my partner doesn't? But it just requires you, and that's what changes the other person. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, and also one has to make a decision. The biggest decision I had to make is, who am I choosing to be now in this moment, at this stage of my life? irrespective of the behavior of anyone else. Mm. So am I going to be um, kind and sweet and generous until somebody's a bitch and then I can retaliate? Or am I going to choose to be kind, sweet, generous even when they are not behaving like I would like them to? It's a, it, it's a never-ending, almost a watch that you have to put on yourself that you don't fall into those negative behavior patterns because it's taken you 30 years to create that persona. So when we start getting that persona to, to take a secondary place, it fights for its own survival. So it challenges you even more to, so that it can stay in your face all the time and be who you've allowed it to be for 30 years. Now you want to change that and it fights. Well, it's because I think it forces you to be conscious. You know, we tend to think if I grow myself, if I do good, powerful lessons for myself, then, yeah, I'm done and I'm this. But actually, as soon as we're not conscious, we right back down to where we were before we did any of that work. I'm not talking about just reacting differently. I'm talking about physiologically managing the chemistry. That's what stuff like grace work and meditation is all about. But if you take it a little bit deeper and you consciously manage your body's chemistry, it's possible with meditative technique. And it's a very simple technique that's doable in traffic or anywhere else. And I learned that years ago. And I practice that daily. And if it wasn't for that practice, I would not have coped with the, with the tragedy. I would have just driven to a mountain and dived off. Mm. So if we don't learn to change our... To, 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 control our chemistry, excuse me, if we don't learn to control our chemistry, then the fear mechanism that is built inside of us is going to run, with, run away with us in any of it. Irrespective of how much we chant and play with crystals and light yeah, incense exactly. and whatever, you know? Because we're not in control. I mean, you mentioned the tragedy and <laughs> I, I, I even had a second thought about even talking about it in the interview in case it got us both going. <laughs> But I did want to say this. So then, so then what you're talking about is a kind of mastery, and mastery is something you talk about quite a bit. Can you just tell us what, you, what do you define as a master? A master for me is somebody who, has, who, is, who is at peace with everything this planet has to offer. And for me, as I understand it, um, we are here to experience everything on the planet. And everything is really... a, a, a 
a holy trinity. There's a positive aspect to a thing, there's a negative aspect to a thing. And we'll swing in this pendulum backwards and forwards, lifetime after lifetime, until we become calm or at peace or we master the thing. For instance, um, animal abuse. There are people that are vehement about animal abuse. So saving animals is really a huge priority for them. Its opposite side of the coin is the abuse of animals or the destruction or the pain or the hurt that we cause animals. It's not two things. It's not separate from each other. It's one thing. So um, people get angry with me if I say, if you're creating a life with a, with a, with a purpose called saving the animals, you have to concurrently co-create its polar opposite. And if you don't concurrently co-create its polar opposite, what will you have to save? So it's a pendulum swing that we're the victims and the perpetrators lifetime after lifetime, and we'll do it again and again and again until we have peace, until we understand there's nothing to harm and there's nothing to save. It is as it should be. That is mastery. But we're emotional beings. So there are, there are different triggers for different people. So for some people, it will be the environment. and other people, it will be whales. And me, it's women abuse. It, it drives me nuts. The top of my head wants to blow. Those are things that I haven't reached mastery about. But there are other things that I have. So I think um, some of us have dealt with some things and we've reached mastery and some of us are battling. And I noticed that all of my old soul friends seem to be really battling with this thing called money. Because we have these high levels of compassion and we want to help the world, the world does not financially reward kindness. It rewards commerce. <laughs> so it, it, kindness doesn't make money, and all souls are inherently kind. So we tend to be battling and look at money quite a lot. So we clearly haven't achieved mastery about money. So it's the Holy Trinity. It's the, the, the positive, the negative, and then eventually... It becomes a neutral thing that we can aspire to, and it's an aspirational thing for me. So it's, I, I mean, is that the same as learning to detach, which spiritual masters often talk about? Is it detachment? Well, detachment is not the same for me as mastery. Detachment, for me, the word detachment means I look and I, I have no compassion. Mastery for me to suggest is rather there but for the grace of God go I, that you can have a sense of gratitude that you've dealt with this particular lesson. And you don't leave the injustice to carry on. So if, I'm, if, if, I've been, if I've reached mastery about child abuse, for instance, that doesn't mean I'm not going to intervene when I see the abuse. I would rather step in and say, let me teach you about love. So then what about, say, the political situation? So you've got all people screaming hate and abuse at each other and uh, all those sorts of things. How do, we, how do we hold ourselves in that? I had a discussion with a friend of mine um, who happens to be black, and I was going, nah, 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 this one political leader with the red beret. And she said, what are you moaning about? He is being himself authentically. <laughs> So for me, I look at him and I go, who is his opposite coin? And I go, perhaps something like a for for book. <laughs> <laughs> and then that can bring <laughs> a little bit of perspective. And I go, oh, it's from a different political aspect, but it's the same stuff. Mm. You know, um, no, no. Yogananda, the, the, the yogi master of the early 20th yeah. century, said that Essentially, I mean, it's not only his idea, it's, I think it's a Hindu philosophy idea, that essentially we are actors on a stage. That this isn't our real self, our real reality, it's just one lifetime that's very brief. And the, the yeah. soul self is eternal and kind of, we could step back and laugh if we only understood we're just acting. So, sometimes perhaps we need to realize that the people in our lives are just people on the stage. I know. I use, it, I, I use it to demonstrate in my workshop how we put a life together. Sometimes we can have a life uh, like a movie, and then the movie is a thriller. And sometimes we can create a movie that is a tragedy, and sometimes we can create a movie that's a drama, and sometimes we create a movie that's a love story. And in each movie, we play the lead. 
But when we finished making the movie, the actors don't beat each other up because you broke my heart or you stole my money or you... <laughs> We go, we made the most incredible wow. movie, well done. So for me, that's how I explain it. And if I can maintain my, myself in that level of consciousness, then I don't get so angry. But I, the, the, it's, it's, it's difficult to stay centered and in a space of love when somebody is screaming in your face, I hate you. But we've had, we, we handed out 40 years of hate, so we can't expect 25 years of hate so, in return and then make it go away. So it's, everything is in balance. And it's hard to stay in balance when there's so much hatred. You know, in the book, you tell the story of your stepmother from hell, who, you know, I, I wanted to actually call you up and say, I volunteered to go and do something about this. She made me so mad, <laughs> vicariously. <laughs> um, but, you know, and there, you know, you're a child and, and you can do nothing and you can't even have a consciousness that says, I can choose differently or I can... So... So what do people do when they've got those past situations where there isn't someone they can look at and realize this is that? How do we let go? Well, for me, for me, uh, my whole life, this particular lifetime, that Chinese proverb that says, may you have an interesting life, that's me. So I've had a, a really busy life. So my next life, I'm going to just paint my nails and drop 30 IQ points at least in every life. Yeah, no, I'm with However, you in the next chair on that lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> So um, for me to, 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 look at, to look at tragedy that happens to people, and we all, we all have a story, Rod, we all have a story that's painful and sore. So for me, I, I, I actually look at these experiences now as a, as a strengthening experience. Without that stepmother experience, I would not have learned resilience. So it took me many years. It took me many years not to have hatred for this woman. It took me many years and lots of therapy. And eventually I got to a space where I thought either this hate for her is going to consume me or I'm going to let it go and say, thank you for teaching me resilience. And it's, it's not, it's, it's take one thing that you learned, pick a positive thing. She taught me resilience. And I hang on to that. So she begins to fade into the background. That the resilience is the, is the triumphant rising out of the ashes thing rather than this experience called stepmother. But always ask yourself what you'd rather feel. So even in your relationship, if you're fighting with your husband, you stop for a moment and go, what would you rather feel? And then modify your words and your demeanor to match what you'd rather feel. That is such a gift that you've given us. That is such a gift. I mean, you know, I started off by saying, for me, one of the many reasons I asked you to be on the show is because this is the manual on love and relationships that you've written. And I think that little gift um, is a good demonstration on why, on why it can make such a big difference. I think there are a lot of people who just watch that, that you made a big difference in some of the hurt and pain that they might be experiencing in their okay. relationships right now. Yeah. So thank you for that. I and no, uh, I mean, we could talk forever, but I just want to mention um, another gift that you've got up your sleeve because um, we're, run we're running out of time fast. And that is um, what's next. Firstly, I know that you're planning um, a festival of some kind this year. What is it? So I've created the Lokinwi Body Mind Spirit Festival. Lo Kinwi, love, kindness, wisdom. I was going to ask if that was an African <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the, the Lo Kinwi Body Mind Spirit Festival is going to take place in Johannesburg on the 14th and 15th of September. We've just secured a venue, so it's going to be in River Sands, and it's just north of Four Ways, which is really lovely. I can't wait. We're going to have stalls, and we're going to have music, we're going to have demonstrations, we're going to have South Africa's top 24 speakers. Um, is there a website people can go to, or how can they get more information about it? At the moment, I'm still building the website, but you can find it on Facebook under yeah. Low Kinwi Body Mind Spirit Festival. Brilliant. And, uh, and what about the book? Where can people get Love Versus Fear? They can get it on my um, publishing website on lkpublishers.co.za. 
Um, and it's, I'm going to put it back on Amazon very soon. Within the next couple of weeks, it'll be available on Amazon again. Any chance that there's another book up your sleeve? <laughs> the second book is um, in the production process at oh, the moment. Good. You mentioned earlier on that, write this down when I write something on Facebook. My son actually said to me, what's going to happen when you die with all this beautiful stuff you've written on Facebook? So I've extracted that. Oh. And, said, <laughs> and created a book called Diary of a Wannabe Philosopher. So that's in the production phase at the moment. Oh, that's great. I can't and wait. my third book is about 70% written. And the title of the third book is going to be Get Your Shit Together. Certainly looking forward to more books from Hilda. Be sure to check that one out, of course. I'll be back next week at the usual time. See you then.